every four years we have an election, and every four years I write another book about politics. And uh, I have a friend who comes over from France. He's the, uh, uh, by the way, there's some awesome books down here. Have you noticed that? Some, uh, I, I was just, uh, I was getting distracted. There's a biography of Carter Glass over on that bookshelf. He was the co-author of the Glass-Steagall Act, of all things, which we'll be talking about later. But uh, every four years I write another book about politics, and a friend of mine who's an editor of a newspaper in, in uh, France comes over, and we, uh, we go to the conventions together, and we drive around the country, and he, he looks at America, and he says, he likes to say, <laughs> it's, you know what, it's okay. I, I have been there. But uh, he comes over to America every four years, and we drive around like West Virginia or Western Kansas or something like this, and he says to me, Tom, every four years I come over to your country, and every four years it's a little bit worse. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's, he's kind of right about that. So I have spent uh, the last 16 years of my life writing about the conservative movement in America. You know, it's kind of a fascinating thing. And uh, some years ago I wrote a book about uh, conservatives in my home state of Kansas, um, and in particular about the many ways in which the Republican Party ropes in working class people with all these sort of different varieties of fake populism. Y'all can hear me now? Is that okay? All right. With all these different varieties of fake populism that, that they are so, you know, excellent at inventing. And today, as we watch the rise of, I think, the greatest fake populist of all time, <laughs> right? Donald Trump. It's a sort of Huey Long without the compassion. <laughs> so I want to, as, as we watch this happen, I want to talk about something that I hinted at at the very end of, the, of What's the Matter with Kansas, but didn't really go into any, in any detail. What I said at the very end of that book was that a good helping of the blame for the right-wing backlash has to go to Democrats as well. What I said was that the, de the degree to which the Republicans have won these voters over is the same degree to which the Democrats have abandoned them. And so I think this is finally the year to ask, I mean, it's a good year to ask, whatever happened to the party of the people? Now, how do I mean this question in two specific ways? First of all, how did the Democrats come to abandon uh, working people, right, the middle class of this country. And in a related point, why did the Democrats fail to respond appropriately to what I think is the greatest issue of our time? And what issue do I mean by that? Well, President Obama himself has said, and I agree with him, that inequality is the defining issue, I'm sorry, the defining challenge of our time. And you think about it, and, you know, that's a very sweeping statement, but in fact, it's not anywhere near sweeping enough. This word inequality, I don't really like it. It's kind of a euphemism. You know, what, what we mean by inequality is the whole, you know, the way that we are all going to live together as a society. It's, it's you know, it's an enormous issue. And uh, we use this little euphemism, inequality or income inequality. It's a kind of shorthand for all of the things that have gone to make the lives of the rich so much more delicious year on year for the last three decades, and also for the things that have made the lives of working people so wretched and so precarious in that same time. This word inequality, what it means is, well, it's visible in the ever-rising cost of health care and college, in the coronation of Wall Street and the slow blighting of wherever it is that you happen to live. And you catch a glimpse of inequality every time you hear about someone that had to declare bankruptcy because a child got sick, or when you read about the lobbying industry that drives Washington, D.C., or the new political requirement that we have in this country, the new constitutional requirement that every, president, every presidential candidate either has to be a billionaire's favorite or a billionaire themselves. Inequality is about the way that speculators and even criminals get a helping hand from Uncle Sam while the Vietnam vet down the street from you loses his house. Inequality is the reason that some people find such incredible significance in the ceiling height of an entrance foyer or the, you know, the hop content of a beer, while other people will never believe in anything again. Inequality is a, a euphemism for the Appalachification of our world. And I, look, 
I'm the guy that knows that the Republicans are largely to blame for this, right? These are the guys who bear primary responsibility for this plutocracy that we live in these days. They're the party that launched us on our modern era of tax cutting and wage suppressing, and they made a religion of the market, and they fought to open our politics to the influence of money at every level. I know this. But just blaming the Republicans one more time and turning the old TV set back to MSNBC it's not good enough. Not anymore. The things I, I, just, I just described are represent a failure of the Democratic Party as well. Look, protecting the middle class society used to be the Democrats' traditional mission. You think about, uh, I mean, Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Lyndon Johnson. This is the situation that we're in today. Those guys were born to deal with that kind, exactly that kind of situation. They were terrible in all sorts of other ways, but one thing they were really, really, really good at was defending the middle class way of life. That's what the Democratic Party was all about. Shared prosperity. This was always their highest aim, right? Defending the middle class world, it was a sacred mission. And they would never shut up about it back in the old days. And it's true that to this day, Democrats are still the ones who are always pledging to raise the minimum wage and raise the taxes of the rich. But when it comes to what President Obama calls the defining challenge of our time, however, many of our modern Democratic leaders falter. They acknowledge that inequality is rampant, and it's an awful thing, and they cry great big fat tears about it, but they can't find the conviction or the imagination to do what is necessary to reverse it. And instead, they dish up, you know, the same high-minded policy platitudes that they've been putting out since the 1980s. They tell us that there's nothing anybody can do about technology. There's nothing anybody can do about globalization, right? You know, God himself wrote NAFTA. Nothing you can do about that. That's globalization. That's the invisible hand. And what are they, what are they, what's, their, what's their answer to inequality? You know what it is. They promise us charter schools, more job training. And yeah, they'll shovel out the student loans. But other than that, they got nothing. Now, take something, well, well the issue that I think is, to this day, the most important issue of our, of our young century uh, the Wall Street bailouts back in 2008 and 2009. This was the historical inflection point uh, where our country could easily have changed course, but our leaders chose not to. You remember what it was like. I mean, this wasn't all that long ago. Barack Obama, you know, we're in the middle of this kind of economic catastrophe. Barack Obama is elected president on this, uh, this unbelievable wave of hope and enthusiasm. I don't know about you, but I thought he was our generation's Franklin Roosevelt. I was very excited. And he then proceeded to continue the policies of President Bush basically unchanged, at least for the first couple of years of his uh, administration. No, no big banks ever got put into receivership. No bailouts ever got unwound. No elite bankers ever got prosecuted. So Obama and his Democrats refused to change course when every sign was telling them to turn, when it would have been good policy to turn, when it would have been overwhelmingly popular to turn, when the country fully expected them to turn. And I don't mean just you and me. I mean the Wall Street bankers themselves were like, oh, shit, here it comes, right? And when it was fully within his power to turn the wheel and steer the country in a different direction. Everybody was expecting him to do it. We elected him to do it. He had the power to do it. It would have been good for the country to do it. And what I'm saying is on this matter, there was no conflict between pragmatism and idealism. That's how the, uh, the Democratic primary that's going on right now, that's how it's always cast, right? Hillary is the practical one. Bernie's the idealistic one. Well, on this issue, there was no conflict. The idealistic thing was also the practical thing. It was the healthful thing. It was the popular thing. It would have been good for the economy. They chose not to do it. Now, why is that? It's, I mean, it's a fascinating question. It's a question that we'll be arguing about the rest of our lives. Now, I know that Democrats are the good guys in our system, or I, I should probably say the less bad guys. <laughs> but it, it's not a coincidence that 
all of the economic gains of the recovery that we've had since then, since 2009, all of the economic gains of this recovery presided over by a Democratic president, by a Democratic president who everyone tells us is the most liberal president we can ever expect to have, all of the gains of this recovery have gone to the already wealthy. And this is not or I should say it's not only because, you know, satanic Republicans have ingeniously, you know, thwarted the righteous liberal will. Yes, I know they play the game. They're very, very good at it. Uh, they're, you know, they're awful and they're forever obstructing him and they're forever gerrymandering and they, they use everything in their power to play the game. I know they do that. But what I'm talking about here on this particular issue is straight up democratic failure. Now, you know that's not exactly the right word. I call it a failure, but uh, you might as well call it a betrayal. And the history of this betrayal goes back a long way. When I was, um, when I was young, back in the 1970s, in the 80s, the, uh, and, and Elliott Bay Bookstore was down in Pioneer Square, where I walked down there this morning thinking that's where it still was. And I... <laughs> And then had to, you know, go running over the hills to this location. <clears throat> when I was young, <laughs> the Democratic Party was forever grappling with its identity, arguing over who the Democrats were and what they stood for. And this went on for decades, all through the 70s, all through the 80s, and up into the 1990s. And you had all of these different factions in the Democratic Party these different reform movements, and they, well, they called themselves reform movements, and they fought like cats and dogs on just about everything, but there was always one thing that they agreed upon. All of these different reform movements agreed upon, and that was that the Democrats had to turn away from the legacy of the New Deal with its uh, fixation on working class people. They disagreed on nearly everything else, but they all agreed on this. The New Deal has to end. And the man who finally brought closure to that long democratic civil war was, of course, President Bill Clinton, who brought this new style of democratic administration to Washington, D.C. Rather than, you know, once he, he gets into the White House, rather than paying homage to the uh, politics of Franklin Roosevelt, as every Democrat traditionally used to do, Clinton did something very different. He did these sort of singular favors for Roosevelt's old enemies, right? The banks, the radio networks, the power companies, the bosses, basically. He uh, deregulated Wall Street. And when I say that, I don't just mean that one, one law, right? It went on and on and on, all through the 90s. This, you know, the different waves of deregulation of Wall Street. And he bailed out a different, he bailed out a hedge fund for Pete's sake. He ensured that derivative securities would be uh, traded without uh, any kind of supervision. Um, he deregulated radio, of course. He deregulated the telecoms. And he basically put an end to the federal welfare system that had been around since 1935. Now, there's something else that he did that I've discovered since uh, you know, I wrote about it in Listen Liberal. Do we have a copy of it around here somewhere? It's got a, big, it's got a sort of a yellowish color yeah. cover to it. Yeah. Um, OK. He <laughs> thank you. Uh, something that I discovered since I wrote this book that nobody turns out nobody knows uh, in 1997. Um, uh, Bill Clinton and the Speaker of the House at the time, Newt Gingrich, uh, had a series of secret meetings at the White House, and they, uh, fi they, you know, they were, they were, they, they finally came to an agreement for how they were going to privatize Social Security. And this is not well known that they did this, but it's it because it was secret. Of course, at the time, it wasn't in the newspapers. Uh, it's no, it's all out in the open now. It's been written up by uh, serious historians, and um, you know they. It, they agreed on a timetable. They had it all figured out. They knew what they were going to do with Social Security. They are going to invest it in, in the stock market. They had a timetable for how they would do it. Clinton would announce it. Gingrich would propose something. They would set up uh, various uh, commissions, and you can guess what the commissions would decide. And they, they, had, they had it all figured out. And uh, Clinton even went through with the first step in his State of the Union speech in 1998, where he said, um, that he was going to save Social Security first. You might remember this. That, that was his code phrase for we're going to privatize it. Now, um, you all know what happened to this, uh, this, <laughs> this beautiful proposal. Monica Lewinsky, the very next day, right? <laughs> and uh, that, we never heard about that, about that plan again. It, I mean, if you ask me, she's a hero, <laughs> you know? <laughs> 
They had to, yeah, they had to put her on a postage stamp is what I think. <laughs> now, uh, Clinton had a, he had a, uh, a strategy as when he was running for office in 1992, when he was running for the presidency, he had this strategy that he would use on the campaign trail where he would uh, go out of his way to insult or to distance himself from some traditional democratic constituency like labor and minorities, uh, and, and thus assure the public that he was his own man. And um, you probably, the most famous example of this is when he contrived to, uh, insult Jesse Jackson to his face while the cameras were rolling. Um, they called this the sister soldier moment. No, nobody remembers the particular of it anymore, but they remember the insult. And, and uh, Clinton's allies and friends always talk about what a, what a genius move this was on his part. Uh, what he was doing when he did this was telling these groups that they had, that they had nowhere else to go. He wasn't going to listen to them. They had nowhere else to go. They had to you know, uh, put up or shut up. And what's weird is when you read the history of the Clinton administration, uh, you know, and when I, when I say the history of the Clinton administration, I don't mean like the sort of right-wing literature, which is all, you know, filled with these crazy conspiracy theories and stuff, but I mean the serious, uh, you know, uh, serious accounts of his administration. And when you read these, what you discover is that this campaign tactic of insulting your uh, allies eventually became like a full-blown philosophy of governance for this guy. Uh, and the great example here is the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, when, uh, you know, if you remember back, back to those days, the previous president, George H.W. Bush, you know, George Bush's dad, had negotiated it with Mexico and Canada, but couldn't get it through Congress because, of course, Congress was controlled in those days, as it had been since the 1930s, by the Democratic Party, and they were like, no way. And organized labor was bitterly opposed to it. But Clinton was able to ram it through. This is something that only a Democrat could get done, and he got it done. But here's, what, here's what's remarkable about this. And this was, of course, celebrated in the same way as his sister soldier moment was, right? He was showing these guys that he was boss. But when he did this, he wasn't merely insulting his friends in organized labor. Think about it. He was conniving in their ruin, OK? He was assisting in the diminishing of their economic power. He was doing his part to undermine his own party's greatest ally to ensure that henceforth in any kind of dispute with its workers, management would always have the upper hand. Could always, you know, if you protest or go on strike or something like that, they can always say, well, we're moving the plant to Mexico. And they do this all the time. It's a very common strategy, not necessarily moving it, but threatening to move it. It happens all the time. Um, so in passing NAFTA, Clinton made the problems of working people materially worse. Now, why am I going into all of this stuff? If we want to understand why the Democratic Party has failed us again and again and again, this is where you have to start. You have to look back to these issues in the 1990s. Uh, and NAFTA is a perfect one because it's as close to a straight-up class issue as you ever see in this country. And NAFTA gives us a... Uh, sort of perfect crystalline understanding of, you know, who our modern day Democrats mean to please, okay? Uh, if you go back and look at the debate over NAFTA in the media, it was, the media was very lopsidedly in favor of it. It was, it, the, the professional class generally, professionals and the rich were very much in favor of NAFTA, uh, while working people, members of unions, uh, were very much opposed to it. It was a straight class divide right down the middle. And uh, it was, you know, uh, there, was, there was all sorts of, uh, how should we put it, status overtones to it. That it was all about education. If you had gone to college and had gone to Economics 101, you knew that trade was a good thing, right? It's like, duh, right? Of course. And so there was this moment where you had 283 economists signing an open letter to President Clinton saying that the treaty would be a net positive for the U.S., both in terms of employment creation and overall economic growth. Things like this. It was very common. And here's the... Um, Here's the sort of awful, uh, ironic den denouement of all this, is that the predictions of the people you know, who hadn't finished high school, who opposed the treaty, turned out to be far closer to what eventually came to pass than did all these rosy scenarios of the 283 economists and the Rhodes scholar, Bill Clinton. 
I'm sorry. I shouldn't. I shouldn't make fun of that. I mean, uh, that's that's very. Ad- he's very admirable that he that he that he went to Oxford. I think that's really awesome. Anyhow, <laughs> okay. So uh, again, Clinton's friends and allies uh, in the Democratic Leadership Council, people like that, Washingtonians generally regarded NAFTA as Bill Clinton's finest moment. This was a great achievement. This was a brave act. Uh, I'll give you a, a little taste of what this kind of literature looks like. There's a very uh, admiring biography of Bill Clinton from 1996 by the British journalist Martin Walker. And uh, Walker you know, really likes Bill Clinton, thinks he's a great president, but he, he admits that he has, he's done a few things wrong, but he says that these few failings were, in the end, balanced and even outweighed by his part in finally sinking the untenable old consensus of the New Deal and the crafting of a new one. Okay? This is why Clinton's admirers liked him because he killed the New Deal. That's what he did. That's his great overarching accomplishment, according to his fans, okay? Think about that. Now, when he says the crafting of a new consensus, um, who were the heroes of that new consensus that was aborning back in the 1990s? Well, the same uh, Democratic thinkers who were forever telling the party that they had to abandon workers in the New Deal had the answer. What Democrats had to embrace, they said, was the emerging post-industrial economy. And in particular, the people that the Democrats needed to identify with were the winners in this new economy that we were going into. Uh, the you know highly educated professionals who populated our innovative knowledge industries. And what do I mean by professionals? The traditional ones like lawyers and doctors, but in, beginning in the 1990s, uh, different ones like math PhDs who write derivative securities, biochemists who make prescription drugs, these kind of people. Now, there's a fascinating little sociological anecdote here. If you go back to the 1950s, professionals as a group were one of the most solidly Republican cohorts in America. These were the Eisenhower voters, I mean, big time. If you can remember back to the 50s, your, your doctor was almost certainly a Republican. Uh, you go up to the 1990s, and this, this stratum of society is one of the most Democratic groups there is. They've completely changed sides. Uh, in in just a couple of decades. And that's who the Democrats are these days. They are the party of the highly educated professional class. Now, they have other constituencies, of course, uh, which they talk about all the time, Uh, minorities, women, and the young. This is what they call, they, they have a name for it, they call it the Coalition of the Ascendant. But in this coalition, professionals, this is their term. You, you guys have never been to the other Washington. They talk about this stuff all the time. They're very open about this. You go to dinner parties and they'll tell you all about it. It's a, but in this coalition, professionals are always the ones who come first. This is the group whose views matter. This is the group whose technocratic outlook always prevail. And it is always prevails. And it's there, it's professionals' tastes and manners that are always celebrated by liberal newspapers. And you know what I'm talking about here, right? You're in Seattle, right? Artisanal everything, right? <laughs> and it's this very, very particular, you know, the very particular professional way of looking at the world that is taken for granted by liberals as being objectively true. And so what I'm saying is that professionals dominate liberalism in the Democratic Party in the same way that Ivy Leaguers dominate uh, Barack Obama's cabinet. Now, okay, I'm not going to drink the water this time. Democrats have all of these um, kind of uh, amusing but very flattering phrases for this uh, this most cherished demographic, this group that they love so much. They 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 call these high, achi- for example, they call these high achieving professionals the wired workers who will inherit the future. They're supposed to be a learning class that truly gets the power of education, right? You've got the working class, and then you've got the learning class. I love that one. They're a a creative class. You've heard this before, right? They're a creative class that naturally rebels against fakeness and conformity. They're an innovation class that just can't stop coming up with awesome new stuff, right? And of course, you know, de- so Democrats, this is the main part of their coalition. This is the, the main group in their coalition. This is 
they imagine them to be the heroes of, of the sort of unfolding historical dialectic, right, the learning class. And of course, democratic leaders are themselves also, by coincidence, drawn from this very group. I mean, uh, it's, it's no surprise that uh, both Bill Clinton and Barack Obama were plucked from obscurity by prestigious universities. Their life story, the biographies of, of the Democratic leaders are, it's actually very fascinating to sit down and read a whole bunch of them because they all have this very similar trajectory. Uh, Bill Clinton, for example, a uh, very interesting life story. He's this kid in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Uh, he goes to Georgetown University. He becomes a Rhodes Scholar. He goes to Yale Law School, and the doors of the world open up for this guy. And it's the same story with Barack Obama, who goes to Columbia, and then to uh, uh, Harvard Law School, uh, becomes the editor of Harvard Law Review, and the same thing happens. The world opens up for him. Hillary Clinton is the exact same story. And if you think about their... Uh, their cabinet choices, the people that advise these two presidents. It's all these uh, successful professionals whose worth is established by their achievements in graduate school or you know, in professional practice. Now, what I'm saying here is that this shift of allegiance by the Democrats from the traditional working and middle class to professionals, that this shift is what explains all these things that are so frustrating and so irritating, so maddening about our modern day democratic leaders. This is what explains, I think, the vexing problem of Obama and the banks. I mean, why is it, go back to the question that we started with, why is it that the Obama team failed to do what obviously had to be done with the banks? Why did they declare that Wall Street executives were gonna be held to a different legal standard than ordinary citizens. And they actually did this, okay? The guy who did it had to resign, but I mean, basically he was, he was, he was speaking the truth. Uh, why did the Obama team choose Wall Street over ordinary people again and again? It's because, I think, for the achievement conscious people who fill the Obama administration, investment bankers are more than friends. These guys are classmates. These guys are they themselves. I mean, the two groups that I'm describing here are the same, right? You, they go back and forth through the revolving door. There's no difference between them. Wall Street is filled. They, the Obama team, they take this, you know, they look at Wall Street and what do they see? It's an industry that's filled with people of subtle minds, you know, this sophisticated jargon, you know, how they talk, you can't understand a word, and this extraordinary innovativeness, right? They're, they look at Wall Street and they're like, that's exactly the kind of creative individuals that the Democratic Party theory, theory tells us that we're supposed to respect and honor, right? They're making these financial instruments that are so admirably complex, <laughs> right? Here, a little anecdote here. So I have a friend who is a, a old school bank regulator, bank regulator from, from uh, decades ago. He was instrumental in sending a number of SNL executives to prison. <laughs> And, uh, or I should say in prosecuting them. I don't know what actually happened, but he, he helped to prosecute these guys. And he told me that in his day as a bank regulator, when they would see a, a bank in, in, you know, engaging in uh, undue complexity, they'd be like, oh, red flag there, right? That is a, that's a marker of fraud. <laughs> you know, when you see that, you go and you, you look at it, right? Well, for the Ob Obama people, it's the opposite. They look at that and they're like, ooh, that's sophistication. <laughs> Right, and they they really do. Right, one of these one of uh, I forget which uh, official in his administration said it, but it's like financial rocket science, he said. And by the way, he said that as an excuse for why they weren't prosecuting these guys because they can't. Nobody understands it, man. It's financial <laughs> rocket science. It's so complex. And you know, it's exactly the same for big pharma. You know it, right? You can't sign a trade deal. You can't write a trade deal that would import generic pharmaceuticals or something like that. No, you have to protect these innovative companies. And oh, mega dittos, mega dittos for Silicon Valley, right? This industry that can do virtually no wrong in democratic eyes. I mean, up until this business with FBI and Apple, right? 
<laughs> yeah, but that's all over now, right? We'll, we'll get back to, get back to uh, business as usual, right? These guys are so lovable, so professional, so creative that for this one industry, for Silicon Valley, enforcement of our country's antitrust laws has basically been suspended. Right? Think about uh, what Hillary Clinton was doing as Secretary of State. Uh, she had this idea, she was proselytizing for it all over the world. She called it internet freedom. And the idea was that access to certain Silicon Valley servers, right, like Google and Facebook, and the, access to these servers was a basic human right. <laughs> Okay, that was the foreign policy of your country in the first four in the first four years of the Obama administration. I'm quite serious. All right, now I'll drink that water. So what what does a party of the professional class believe in? Well, the most uh, you know important item on the list, a number one item on the list, is of course meritocracy, the conviction that the successful deserve their rewards, that the people on top are up there because they are the best. That's meritocracy. This is the first commandment of the professional managerial class. But I'm here to tell you meritocracy is not a particularly good way to take on the problem of income inequality, okay? I mean, this is not a doctrine for mitigating inequality. This is a doctrine for rationalizing inequality, the idea that everybody gets what they deserve and what they deserve is determined by how they did in school. This is not a good way to take on income inequality, right? And what I'm getting at is this. There is no solidarity in a meritocracy. Meritocracy is the, exactly the polar opposite of solidarity. It's very close to, you know, every man for himself, basically. Now, leaders of the professional class, the people on top of the various professions, the people in the cabinet, the people you know, who went to the right graduate school or whatever, they show enormous respect for one another, this enormous kind of deference, right? The, the, the Obama people look at, at Wall Street and, they, and, and the people at the top and they're like, uh, you know, respect, right? But uh, there, there is virtually no solidarity, there's zero solidarity, sympathy or anything like that for less fortunate members of their own group, okay? What do I mean by this? Think about the white collar uh, workplace. When, when someone in one of these, like say a great big pharmaceutical uh, outfit gets fired, do his colleagues rally, rally around him and go on strike and demand that he, of course not. That's not how it works in the white collar, in the professional workplace, right? You, you, if something like that happens to you, it's clearly because you deserved it. Uh, another example. I myself am a member of this class, by the way. I should uh, point that out. I went out and got a PhD at one point in my life. I worked and worked and I got one. And it was in history, American history. And uh, when I got out of graduate school, I discovered that something had happened to the uh, market for historians. It had basically been casualized, and there were no tenure track jobs anymore. There were very, very, very few. And uh, you, you know, and this is—you've you've heard about this problem. We all, my generation of historians and of people who are studying English and people who are studying French and people who are studying, uh, you know, almost anything in the humanities, uh, had to become adjuncts. And that's what we did. Uh, and it, you know what this is, is you work really hard, you teach three times a week, you, you earn about, you know, you earn very little money. And that's, that's, what, that's what had happened to you know, these people, people like me who had gone out and got the highest degree there is and worked really hard. And, um, and uh, you know, that we're, we thought we were at the peak of professional achievement and all this kind of thing. And what I'm, the way the story ends is, <clears throat> the people who were who did have the tenure track, who did have the tenure jobs, the people who were the sort of at the top of our various uh, uh, professions, how much sympathy do you think they had or have for adjuncts? You know, the, you know what the answer is, right? It's almost zero. There are good professors here and there who you know whose hearts in the right place and they understand what's happening to their professions, but by and large, meritocracy kills any sense of solidarity. Look. The story I tell in Listen Liberal is in some ways a, uh, a happy one, uh, <laughs> an inspiring one. What do I mean by that? I mean, it's the, it's the story of, think about this, it's, it's a grand kind of 19th century story. It's the coming together of money and merit, of success and righteousness, of finance and political virtue. Right? And virtue and righteousness, 
is what being a liberal is all about these days. That's the name of the game. But in another sense, the transformation of the Democratic Party has been a disaster. Look, left parties all over the world were founded to advance the fortunes of working people. That's why they exist. That's why they used to exist. But our left party here in America, one of our two monopoly parties, by the way, don't ever forget, monopoly system, our left party chose over the last 30 years to turn its back on these people's concerns and make itself instead into the tribune of the enlightened professional class, the creative class that makes all these innovative things like derivative securities and smartphone apps. The working people that the party used to care about, Democrats figured, had nowhere else to go in the famous Clinton era expression. Well, folks, they have found somewhere else to go. Look, by abandoning these people, Democrats have made inevitable both the economic desolation that has overtaken the part of the country where I used to live, as well as this populist backlash against liberalism that has been building now for decades. Now, Ten years ago, I wrote about what it looked like in my home state of Kansas. Well, folks, it is everywhere today. I mean, it is the backlash is all over the country now. It is swarming up out of the deindustrialized zones, screaming its you know, bizarre Trumpian slogans. And you think about the choice that that's going to leave us with this year. I mean, it's you think about this, right? On the one hand, what do we got? On the one hand, if things play out the way it looks like they're going to play out, and Trump is the Republican nominee and Hillary is the Democratic nominee, look, what does that leave us with? On the one hand, this kind of angry right-wing intolerance, and on the other, inequality forever. Folks, there has got to be a better way. Thank you very much. Now, I know that was a downer, but look, we're going to ask questions, and I, and I do have some, some hope about this and that, and I brought a pen to sign books with, so how do you want to do this? Do you guys have a microphone? Oh, it's a small room. Just shout, let's, let's go. Yes? Well, on the so-called liberal side, there is Bernie screaming. Bernie. Question number one is Bernie, again. <laughs> well, he's leading in yeah. Didn't he win here? Didn't he? Yes, didn't he, yeah, he, he? But he. But he won here by a mile, right? Yeah. yeah. And in Alaska and in Hawaii. Yeah. Yeah. So and she got angry and calling his campaign <laughs> liars for daring to say she took money from the fossil fuel industry. Oh, is that right? <laughs> so oh well. Anyway, why are the so-called liberals and not those who are totally wealthy and entitled, and we all know some of them? Supporting her so strongly. Supporting Hillary so strongly. His glass steagle. Yeah. Well, and all the rest of it. So what, why are so I, I thought you were going to ask me about if I saw any hope in Bernie, but instead you're asking me the opposite. Why you know why are people why are people why is anyone supporting Hillary? You know, uh, it's a good question. Uh, so. Uh, you know, uh, look, uh, the, the, and and you might you might also put it why why do people remember Bill Clinton with great fondness? And there was a time not all that long ago when Bill Clinton was the sort of designated uh, guy in the Democratic Party to reach to to speak to progressives. He was supposed to represent the progressive wing. Of, I, I I could not understand that when that was that was just a few years ago when that was happening. But um, I think that people remember him so fondly because the uh, two reasons, well, three really, but mainly because the economy was doing so well in the late 90s. You had three years there where employment, where the wages, you, almost full employment, and you had real wage growth in this country, which has been very unusual since the 1970s. And so for, for a lot of, um, of, of middle class, working class people, those were good times. Those were the, like, some of the best times they, they can remember. And he was president, and he had such a good mood. He was so, you know, he was this charismatic guy. And then the other thing is the, uh, the way the Republicans persecuted him. I mean, the, the, uh, uh, his impeachment was so insane and so unfair. I mean, that was the one moment when I really liked him, you know, <laughs> was, was when, they were, when they were really, you know, uh, persecuting him. It was so, it was crazy. You had to be on his side. And everybody remembers that. And it's, it's you know, if you really uh, uh, fear and hate the Republicans, and many people do, and for good reason, 
Uh, if you fear them more than you hope for, you know, th then Hillary is your choice. You want to identify with with with, with that. Th the sad thing, and it's also look, there are a million other factors that come into play. Bernie is not a well known; he's not a national nationally well known figure. Uh, he's he's from Vermont, which is uh, you know kind of a stigmatized place to be from these days. You know, thanks to all of the Vermont, you know, like the Howard Dean episode, and. Uh, he has that accent, that Brooklyn accent. I find it charming, but a lot of people don't get it, you know? And uh, it, it, look, it is amazing to me. Let me flip it around a little bit. It's amazing to me. I interviewed Bernie in 2014, and I think he's a great man. I think he's a real statesman. I really admire him, and I plan to vote on him when we vote for him when we have our primaries in Maryland. Uh, I think it's amazing that he's done as well as he has. I, it, it blows my mind to think that this guy with these handicaps has beat a Clinton in any primaries at all. And he, in fact, he's really challenging her. It's fantastic. I'm so happy about it. And now I'm going to give you the ray of hope. Let's say, I mean, okay, for, the ray of hope is off in the future. Okay, well, here's what I think will happen this year. I think Hillary will get the Democratic nomination. She'll beat Trump. Uh, and Hillary is going to be, I think, the cons more a fairly conservative candidate. She's basically running as a complacency candidate right now. You know, nothing is going to change. And if nothing changes, and this situation just goes on, and inequality gets worse, and look, folks, we're seven years since the last, since the uh, since the beginning of the of the last recovery. We're at the end of the business cycle now. I mean, we're we're, you know. You're going to start. People are going to start saying we're overdue for another recession very soon, and you know more than 50 percent of America never thinks that the, the last recession ended, because you know why? For them, it didn't, right? If this goes on, I mean something has changed permanently in this country. When you have a, a recovery that is robust for people like around here, for people in Washington, D.C., for people in a place like Boston, Massachusetts, or San Francisco, when re the recovery is rocking for them, and then people everywhere else in the country are going nowhere, this can't go on, okay? Four more years of that is going to, it's, people are going to be so furious four years from now, and you're going to have another Bernie, and you're going to have, and, and you know, He'll probably be better, or, or she will probably be better organized next. Maybe it'll be Elizabeth Warren, but they'll be better organized next time around. And you watch what happens. And you'll also have another Trump. I mean, that's not going away either, that phenomenon. And you'll have a Trump that's better at being Trump, right? That doesn't go out and piss everybody off the way he has, you know? And, you know, this system is spinning out of control because they, because of inequality. They won't do a goddamn thing about it. Yeah. It was a wonderful historian at the University of Washington named John Bridgman. He passed away just recently. I had him back in the uh, late 60s, 70s. He uh, said the Republican Democratic dichotomy is not what it's all about in this country. It's about the ins versus the outs. Yeah. And I think that's the epitome of both Bernie's appeal and Trump's appeal. They're on the outs. Yeah. And Barack, you know, throw the bastard out, what he did, go back on and on. It's the in versus the out. So given that stature or that that uh, well, Bernie being the outsider yeah. and, and the uh, the uh, idealist as you suggest, um, and maybe you're right, the timing's not right, but but get to the point of you mentioned Elizabeth. Do you have any insight into uh, that I actually, woman's availability as a... I'm surprised she didn't run. I thought this was her year. What I, about just being a, taking the easy job as vice president with Bernie, and so she can just focus on Wall Street <laughs> and then set herself up for two four-year terms? Yeah, that would be awesome, yeah. wouldn't that? Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be fantastic? Yes, uh, any comments on your insight? In I, I actually, I'm actually surprised. I thought that she would run this year, and I'm surprised that she didn't. Right. But I don't, I don't understand why she didn't. I don't really... I have I have met her, uh, yeah, but I don't have any insight into why she didn't run. Um, that you know. By the way, I like what you're saying about the in, the ins and the outs, and that's that was a classic 19th in the 19th century. That was the classic way of interpreting uh, politics because, of course, the parties were very very similar up until you up until William Jennings Bryan, and you had this famous incident. I was going to use it as the uh, epigraph for the book where. Um, Benjamin Harrison went down. Grover Cleveland won, and. Uh, uh, Henry Clay Frick 
wrote a telegram to Andrew Carnegie, who was like on vacation in, in Scotland or something, and he's like, he told him the news. He's like, uh, Harrison lost, Cleveland is in, and Carnegie wrote back. I don't remember the exact words, but he's like, well, that's that's okay, that doesn't matter. You know, too, I'm sorry about, you know, Benjamin Harrison, you know, you know that's too bad for him, but there's no difference. <laughs> it doesn't make any difference to us. Um, and th that, was the, that was the system back then. I mean, I think it's different now. I think that there really is a difference between the two parties, and I think it's the sociological one that I'm talking about. And what I mean by that is that there's two hierarchies in this country, two higher, two, well, there's more than two, but there's two main hierarchies of power in this country. One is a hierarchy of money, business, Republicans, Koch brothers, and the other is this hierarchy of status that I'm describing with these, you know, the professionalism and 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 they've really come into their own with these new industries, you know, Silicon Valley and uh, and of course Wall Street. And by the way, I w well, no, we'll, we'll come to that later. Let me add, throw this other hilarious or I should say ironic or awful uh, anecdote out there, which is, um, you know, we all voted for Barack Obama in '08, hope and change. It was all about change. Do you ever see the? Um, did, does Jonathan Alter ever come out here? Does he ever come out to, the, the, out, to, out to Seattle? He's written two biographies of Obama. He's a huge admirer of Obama. The second one is about the uh, 2012 campaign, Obama versus Romney. And uh, you know, he's, Obama wins, and this is his great triumph, right, for, for Alter. The title of his book about it, and remember, this is the candidate of hope and change. His title for his second book about Obama is The Center Holds. <laughs> yeah, the center holds, and it will hold again with Hillary, right? That is that is exactly what's going on. Yeah, back there. Um, yeah, you know, you use the word monopoly uh, as you talked, and also in the book in a very interesting way. Yeah. Uh, as an argument against those people who say those damn Republicans who obstructed the Congress, Barack couldn't do anything, you made a suggestion that I've never heard, which is simply just enforce the antitrust laws. Yeah. Now, there's a very interesting... I'm going riff on that. preaching that. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the notion that monopoly suddenly became a good thing when Milton Friedman explained yeah. why it was good and Adam Smith was wrong and it would benefit everybody. Yeah. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. But think about the fact that monopoly is not only economic, but as you mentioned also, we have two monopoly parties. Yeah. And what do you do with cartel, monopolies? Like cartel. Yeah. They, 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 exactly. They, they control all access to politics. You can't pretend they're not there and yeah. form a third party. Right. You have to break up monopolies somehow. And my fondest dream in this particular season is to imagine that by some uh, crazy historical thing that happens at both conventions, uh, the 1860 configuration where there are four candidates running, which allowed yeah. Lincoln to come in with 37% of the votes, <laughs> happens when Trump decides to run and Bernie runs outside the party. Yeah. And then for the first time, we have a real choice, and we, we can start breaking up the parties, which is something we have to do yeah. for any kind of progress on anything. Hey. Look, I agree with you. I, I, I am a big fan of, the, of third parties, and the, as, you, as you know, it's, uh, the 19th century was filled with them, and they were, they were successful back then. Third parties had a, had a when you taught political, well, political science didn't exist in the 19th century, but if they had taught political science in the 19th century, there would have been courses on third parties. The Republicans were a third party. My favorite uh, movement, a third party movement was called populism. I don't know if you had it in Washington. Yes, you did have it in Washington state. It was big, it was huge in Kansas. In Kansas, it's not just a third party, it's the whole mentality of the state to this day. But they swept everything in Kansas and um, the populists were regarded by the two major parties or the leaders of the two major parties as being insane, crazy, like Robespierre, you know, radicals, right? This was the problem. They have to be put down somehow. And as soon as populism died out, the, uh, the two major parties in every state where populism had been a, a threat, this is all over the South and the Midwest and probably here, in every state where it had been a threat, they passed laws essentially making all of the, tech, the, the tactics that the populists had used illegal, okay? Now, there's no good constitutional or, uh, well, pr no principled reason to do that. They just did it to ensure their own monopoly. And the problem is that ever since populism, and populism was a real third party. They had governors, they had senators, they had representatives, they had all the way down the ticket, right? Dog catchers, sheriffs, all this kind of thing. Uh, it wasn't just a billionaire running, you know, like Ross Perot running for, for the presidency. It was, it was a, the real deal. And that's not possible anymore because of all of these laws where the two parties basically insured their own uh, cartel, their own duopoly from here to eternity. And 
that drives me crazy. I love third parties. And thir as we can see now, third parties, a third party would be real healthful right about now. It's sort of exactly the kind of thing that our system could use right now. But we can't have it. And it drives me crazy. And the two parties are not about to put themselves out of business by uh, allowing these uh, techniques to, to return, right? The main technique that they used was called uh, fusion, by the way. We'll, we'll talk about it some other time. But uh, it, so it's a kind of catch-22. You want the two parties to, uh, you know, to pass laws allowing this to, this, this to happen again, but there's no way in hell they're ever going to allow it. And so you have to work within one of the two, which drives me crazy. But look, Bernie, this is another hopeful thing. Bernie is showing how it, how it can be done. His choice was either to run as an, a Ralph Nader style independent or to run inside the Democratic Party. He chose to run inside the Democratic Party. And oh my God, look what happened. Uh, you back there, you had your hand up, yeah. I mean, I missed the first part of it, so I don't know if you, you mentioned this or not. But I mean, doesn't an awful lot of this go back to the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Republican Southern strategy and the uh, the flight of white male, you know, lower income, lower educated voters into the Republican Party. I mean, isn't basically just that simple? No, it's not. It's it's it, that's part of it. Of course, that's part of the story. This is so. I've written now what three books about this and the and this 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 transition. You know, this transformation of the party system, and that's a huge part of it in the early days. But this is. Uh, I mean, what you had is. At the same time as, the, as Nixon and company are reaching out and courting working class voters, you also have the Democratic Party deciding to reject them. And this is, they, they openly did this. This is uh, one of the things that I'm kind of proud of in Listen Liberals, is the, the story of how the Democrats, weirdly, at the same time as, the, uh, as Nixon, were, were deciding to reject these guys. And the issue that did it was not civil rights. It was, uh, for the Democrats, it was, it was Vietnam. And what had happened was the... Um, the, uh, the labor unions, the leadership of the labor unions had supported the Vietnam War. They had supported Johnson on this. And in 68, they had, you know, uh, they were very much identified with the establishment. And the, uh, you know, all of this was crumbling. Unions looked really bad in the late 60s and early 70s. They were uh, dinosaurs. You know, their, their leadership was completely out of touch. Uh, they weren't democratic. And so there was, and, and the Democrats basically sat down. They had this thing called the McGovern Commission, where they decided to, they were going to reorganize the party after the 68 uh, debacle. And they basically decided to um, remove organized labor from its position, uh, its structural position within the party. And the, but the, the Vietnam was the reason they did it. Organized labor uh, had actually been real good on civil rights issues. That was one thing where, the, I mean, they were, they were also, I mean, we all know that there were a lot of unions that were pretty racist. But in a formal way, they had strongly supported it. King had, and King had also supported them back. We always forget that, that when he died, he was at a, um, a trash man strike in, in Memphis. He was supporting the strikers, kind of a heroic, a heroic moment. So well, all I'm saying is that it's slightly more complicated. Well, I mean, I don't know. It just seems to me that the racial tone of everything that's going on today is yeah. no accident. I no, mean, no, that's right. No, absolutely. I mean, it, just, it seems they, to me... They hit that button, yeah. It seems to me, uh, no pun intended, that it really trumps just about everything else. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I mean, just the, and it looks like there's a real backlash uh, paralleling, you know, what happened after the Civil War in the South and, and uh, the rejection of Reconstruction. I mean, all of this is going on. I mean, I, it just seems patently obvious to me that that's a really strong, strong... Of, of, course, it's, of course it is. I mean, Trump is openly, he's an open bigot. There's no, no question about it. But he, I mean, there's also, he's also saying other things. I mean, the, there's always been uh, bigoted candidates, if that's, you know, if, that's, if that's what you want. I think what makes Trump powerful is that he combines that intolerance with, uh, with, with uh, other working class issues, like the, the, what he's saying about trade. And if you watch his speeches, the man is obsessed with trade. By the way, can I, t a, a weird thing with Trump. So I can't stand Trump. Trump is a man who everything about him disgusts me and rubs me the wrong way. I mean, like everything, like his, like, like not just the things he says, his clothes, his hair, his attitude, his TV show. Like uh, if I caught one of my kids watching his TV show, I'd, I would get mad at them, right? He had a show where he would fire people, you know? It, it, it was loathsome, like everything about this guy. So I'm watching, I'm watching his uh, speeches 
And uh, I was writing about this for The Guardian, this newspaper in England. And, uh, and I'll be damned if he didn't say a number of things that I agreed with. And it was a real moment of, what's that called? The cognitive dissonance for me. He was talking about uh, big pharma and how we don't negotiate. In Medicare, we don't negotiate with the pharmaceutical. And it's like, what? Did he really just say that? And he started talking about uh, the military industrial complex and how we pay too much for these weapon systems that don't work. I was like, Dang, <laughs> how did he know that? And so it, I think he's, it's slightly more complicated than that, but not, I mean, obviously that is a huge part of the story, especially in the South. I mean, the South, that's probably, I don't know, 80% of the story. But elsewhere in the country, I, I think it's probably a smaller percentage. Mm, how, like, how much less? Oh, I, have no, I have no idea, I have no idea. Somebody else had their hand up, yes. Yeah, well, coming back to the income inequality thing, which I agree is kind of a central issue, um, how do you solve it? Because, you know, yeah. like, to me, it means really changing the tax code and taking away what, you know, people have been living off of, you know, as you fat know, cows for 30 years. Yeah. And so, with it's going to be a Republican Congress. That's almost yeah. positive to me. Yeah. You know, and so even if Bernie gets into office, you're not going to see change on those levels. It's, it would be so hard to make those change happen. I mean, maybe you, you'd finally get the Wall Street um, bozos prosecuted, you know, but that doesn't change in yeah, the inequality. Too late at this point. And this so, is coming from a state where a few years ago, when we were in the throes of recession, we couldn't even get this state to pass an income tax, which we desperately needed. Yeah. And, you know, and it was an income tax that was only going to go for people making 250000 or more. Yeah. Right, it was very, very small, but you know the opponents of it, like Jeff Bezos and all these others. Hey, he owns the newspaper in my town. Oh, funny about that. Yeah. <laughs> but you know the opponents were, you know, used the method. Oh, slippery slope. You do that, but we have the most regressive tax system in the United States. Yeah. You know, and yet Washington went for Bernie. Well, that's because there was just only about five percent. I heard I might be wrong on that percentage. It was a very small percentage of the electorate that went out to the caucuses. Yeah. You know, so it's not necessarily a victory for Bernie. It gives him momentum, and that's great. But it really doesn't reflect, you know. I know. So what what do you do about inequality? That's the, that's a big question. And uh, and there's a certain fatalism about it when you talk to Democrats. So Obama gave a speech. Uh, it was his State of the Union a couple years ago, and he had or maybe it was this year. I don't. I, it's all. It all is uh, jumbled together, you know. After all my research, but he he gave a very uh, uh, he gave a very moving account of what it's like in the deindustrialized zones and what you know what's what's happening to this country as it's falling apart. And then he basically said, "Well, nothing can be done about that." You know, it's like he called. He said that's he he didn't say that. Of course, he said, uh, "But you know, oh shit, how did he put it?" He said something like, um, uh, "You know, the changes are real." The changes are real, and then he pivoted to another subject and talked about how we had to subsidize, you know, some some industry or something like that. But that's they always blow this subject off, and they're like, you know, it's globalization. Nothing you can do about globalization. It's a, it's a, it's technology. You know, Uber just comes. Uber uh, Uber comes. Uber ruins your job. Nothing can be done. You know, and uh, <laughs> and they they just it's a way of just it's a way of just brushing it off. I mean, look, uh, it, first thing you do is you stop doing things like the TPP. You just stop doing that, you know? And you, you get a, a political party that, that actually, you know, enforces the law of the land with regards to Uber, you know? But there are big things that you can do, and it doesn't have to be invasive, like, uh, you know, a skyrocketing tax, like Rooseveltian tax rate. And what I mean is that civil society will bring about a more equal uh, 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 distribution, a more equal re uh, result by itself, if you allow workers to bargain with management, you know, to get together and bargain with their employer. And at, at this point in our country, that is basically off the table. But you look at what's the difference between our society now and that society in the 40s, 50s, and 60s that made it so different, and there's this glaring thing that was there then that isn't there today, <laughs> you know, and it was organized labor. And labor has a lot of problems, we all know that. But but if you, you know, if you let workers form unions, you will see an amazing shift 
in the, in, the, uh, in the distribution of wealth. Other things that can be done. Well, the Wall Street banks is the great missed opportunity, but that opportunity will be back, I guarantee you. <laughs> It'll happen again, and next time it does, hopefully we'll have a Bernie in there, and, uh, or somebody like Bernie, and, 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 you know, and he, can, he can do what needs to be done. Antitrust. I mentioned antitrust. This is a huge part of it. This is another, when we look at what's changed from those days to this, uh, in, the, in the 60s up into the 70s, uh, the government, uh, the, the federal government routinely broke up large businesses. There's a hilarious, again, I, why, don't, why do I use that word? There's an anecdote, an ironic anecdote. And uh, you know Andre Schifrin? Do you remember Andre Schifrin, the head of Pantheon Books, uh, started the New Press? And in one of his memoirs, he tells this, it opens with this story of in the 60s, he was working, I think, at, I forget which, which, uh, which publishing house he was working at, but one day they merged with another publishing house, which meant that there were only like 11 in America or, or you know, something like that. The next day, the attorney general calls him up, right? And he's like, I don't know about this. I don't know if I'm going to allow this, you know? And they, they finally decided it was okay. But they got upset when a publish, two publishing companies merged. And this is a field that at the time had robust competition. How many are there today? Like four? What, yeah, something like that. I mean, and you look at beer. You know how many beer, big beer, the huge, like the, the, the companies that control the beer market? Two companies that control like 90% of the market. You look at, I mean, and then you look at the sort of the really uh, innovative uh, strategies for achieving monopoly. I mean, this is what Silicon Valley is all about. This is, this is the business strategy in Silicon Valley is to, is to get market power in one way or another, uh, and Amazon is the, is the most famous example of the, you know, these really clever strategies, but there are hundreds of others. I'm telling you, and maybe I'm, this is going to make me an unpopular guy in Seattle, but whoever is the, uh, the next president needs to come in here with a sledgehammer, you know, and that's, yeah. Yeah, that's right, but that was, that was Clinton. He didn't really do, he didn't really seal the deal, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, wait, so you've already asked one. Is there somebody else? Yeah, behind you, yeah. I, I just have a, a comment. I, I really appreciate your class analysis, comrade. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, th I do think that, um, I think that you, um, at your peril to your analysis, perhaps underplay the, the, the role of race. You think the whole thing. I think it's a... It's a long time debate about, yeah. you know, is class the more important thing, is race the more important thing? And I just think, yeah, there's probably lots of stuff behind you that says, uh -huh. talks about Do, it. Do you hear that, though? Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> right. But, okay. but I, I, think, I think it's more complicated than, I, I like your analysis. Well, the, uh, you know what, you know what I do? I mean, we live in a society where w we talk about race all the time. We never talk about class. Never, and so I, I, I often feel like I'm like I'm 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 deliberately doing a kind of corrective, you know. But I'm doing that in all sorts of ways. I think these days. I mean, like uh, you know. So y yesterday, someone was like, um, they were all pissed off at me because I didn't talk about global warming in the book, or I mean, I mentioned it, you know. And it's like, and I feel bad about that. But but uh, if I had written a book about global warming, then she would have been pissed off at me because I didn't write about inequality, you know. And I'm sorry, I'm doing my best here. <laughs> I, li I like what you're saying about the professional class and all that. I, yeah. I, I dig yeah. it. I'm just, I, you know, trying to get the... But look, I'm, I, I don't want to downplay uh, the, the racial angle. I don't want to, I certainly don't want to let Trump off the hook. Uh, I, 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 look, what he, his, 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 I say bigotry because it's mainly, you know, the, what he said about Muslims is just so crazy. Uh, that, you know, he, he, he's put himself, you know, he's absolutely an unacceptable presidential candidate. There's, you know, it, it, you, there's, I don't know any way that, that uh, anybody I know could vote for him. But, uh, yeah. Anyhow. Yeah, back there. Uh, let me just first begin by saying I think you're one of the most acute minds right now in terms of reading the, the right and, and the Liberal Party, for that matter. So for that, thank you. Uh, you mentioned in your book that liberals in general tend to think that education is a magic wand of sorts, that it yeah. can solve all of society's ills. Uh, and I agree, I, I, as a college-educated young man, I, I, I've bought into that, right? Uh, I bought into it a little, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> 50K in debt, in fact. Uh, so with that being said, do you think that there is a great amount of utility for the concept of free college going forward in our society. Absolutely, yes. 
uh, and I'll tell you why. Well, okay, so, uh, I mean, let's talk about this for a second. So this is one of the, the, the big, the major themes in Listen Liberal, is that the professional class, which is defined by its educational attainment, this is, it's, it, that's, that's what, you know, makes you a professional, is the degrees that you get, how you're certified, and you're, uh, you know, uh, and uh, so they naturally think that education is the solution to all problems. And so when you give them an economic problem, they automatically come up with an educational solution. And uh, what this has meant, uh, you know, uh, it's led to all, all sorts of unfortunate consequences, like, you know, now you have to have a college degree to work at Starbucks or whatever. I mean, I'm slightly exaggerating, but only, only slightly. Uh, and you have a whole generation of, of kids now who went to college because they know now that they have to, that there's no alternative to doing that, and the president himself tells them to do it, and they come out and they're massively in debt. And uh, they discover that they're basically screwed because while they're in college, the same thing happened to them as happened to me, which is that the labor market was casualized, and now it's all the gig economy, and you can work as a task rabbit if you want. Do you all, you guys, you guys know what this is? And uh, you know, but uh, yeah, and it's it's led to uh, it's led to to catastrophe. This is something that I wrote about uh, again and again and again at Salon and at the Baffler. Uh, the, the 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 role that the university plays in our imagination and the way we think about class and also the ways that universities have uh, uh, basically profited from that role. We've, we've said to them, you are the gatekeepers of social class and they're like, we are? Awesome, now pay me more, you know? <laughs> I, guess what, being a member of the middle class will now cost you $60,000 a year, you know? Or just, you know, make up some number, right? And that's what they've done. And so what Bernie is, is doing is, is, absolutely, is absolutely right. Um, you know, the, the only way that you're going to put this, to, to put that particular uh, death spiral into reverse is by, uh, by doing what he's suggesting, by making, uh, by at least making it as your goal that we're going to have public universities for free. Now, does everyone really need a college degree? No, they don't. Of course not. But that should be up to them. I sincerely think that. I mean, uh, you know, the, in, a, in a different kind of world, they probably wouldn't have let me go to college because I was kind of a fuck up when I was in high school, you know. And uh, and it worked out. It worked out okay in the end. I write these books, you know. I, you know, I can string words together kind of in a nice way. And I think that should be, um, you know, I just can't stand the. Uh, well, there's a million reasons why you should just let people go to college. I, I, I thank I thank God all the time that. The University of Kansas was open admission. They had to take anybody that graduated from high school. <laughs> you know, and there's there's something to be said for that. And I, I going to college opened it just opened up the world to me. Not in a not in success terms, but in understanding terms. I mean, I remember the first time I heard someone read the Wasteland out loud, and it blew my mind. And it was the most amazing thing. Anyhow. Yeah. So speaking of global warming, one of the paradoxes and also the wedge issues between these two classes is uh, environmentalism. Yeah, and that's global right. Global warming. Yeah. And I mean, having a middle, prosperous middle class with industry, manufacturing, depends on fossil fuels or hydroelectric dams and destroyed rivers, the state, uh, that's not exactly environmentally friendly. So, I mean, that's what, that's what I perceive to be one of the main... So this is the, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. My mom lives out in the Olympic Peninsula, you know, the owl business. And they're, they're still pissed off about those owls. <laughs> so how, how do you see this conflict being solved? And don't tell me it's more than fish. <laughs> I can't use that. That's my... Well, I, how, so do you all hear the question? Is like the conflict between... Uh, uh, working class people and the professionals on the environmental issue. And this goes back a long, long way. Because environmentalism is always perceived to be a sort of, uh, uh, you know, an upper class taste. Uh, and, you know, the uh, people from the East, especially out here in the West, where it's always, you know, rich people from back East uh, coming out here and saying, I want this to be beautiful when I go on vacation, damn it. You know? <laughs> and, and it's very easy. I, I can understand why people object to it, but, uh, you know, global warming is, of course, very real and very serious, and we have to take it seriously. And there, there has to be a way that you can have industry that is, you know, 
just just trying to engineer the problem and work on the problem of having industry that doesn't pollute is itself going to be an enormous project that's going to employ you know millions and millions of people. So I don't think it's necessarily a conflict. Of course, the way we've had it work out in this country, it's been a, a terrible conflict, and people are at each other's throats. And you kind of get the idea that that's the way the uh, politicians like it. You know, that they don't want to resolve this. They 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 like it when people uh, you know. Uh, fight each other and hate each other and, and you know you have a war over seals or a war over owls or something like that. But there's all sorts of ways that you could make this work without um, where working class people, you could have a clean environment and working class people could prosper and even vacation in it themselves. It could be done, folks. <laughs> it's not even hard. I mean, it is hard for me. But if we put some smart people on it, we can figure it out. Yeah. I wonder oh, wait, if it's time yeah, to separate it's, it's, liberalism and democracy. Uh, we smush them together so much that maybe the title, a liberal, de a liberal democracy by Fareed Zakaria, says basically that liberals are much more focused on liberalism than they are about democracy. And yeah. what we're really talking about, the professional class people, yeah. is they're into you know, drawing a circle around themselves and saying, there are rights in here, but in terms of broad power coming from below, which is what democracy is, yeah. they have no commitment to it at all. Uh, not much of a commitment. I think that's probably right. Uh, th th this is one, of, and this has to be the last question. I just looked at my, I just noticed what time it is. But one of the things that, uh, that that's really striking about the professional class is the love of technocracy. That uh, that the 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 you know this the. the the smart people with the advanced degrees can fix everything if, if you put the tools in their hands. This is the sort of the great fallacy that led to the Vietnam War, you know, very famously. But it, it goes on to this day. If you read the Washington Post, one of the sort of running themes in the Washington Post is that everybody with a uh, everybody with you know who, who's who's intelligent at all in the capital knows what the answers are, the answers to our problems. We just have to all get together, put politics aside, put the public aside and what they want and and we'll we'll get to the solutions and by the way this is this is Barack Obama and Bill Clinton are, are big believers in this way of looking at the world. Hey folks, thank you very much and let's sign some books.